Hello and welcome into this journey where four of my industry colleagues in T and I will walk you through the first steps. You'll get an overview of where tea comes from, how it's made, some of the reasons why it's embraced by so many people and cultures, and then we'll move on to which tea types might be your favorites, and finally, how to steep the perfect cup of loose leaf tea. So what do we mean when we say specialty tea or premium tea? Commodity tea is mass produced, machine made, and looks like dust made from the tea grades called dust and fannings. 90% of tea sold in grocery is low grade commodity tea in bags, and 80% of the tea consumed in the US is served ice, the vast majority of which is made from this low grade tea material. Specialty tea is handcrafted, grown in small lots and is identifiable as a leaf tea. There's an intentional focus on quality over quantity and efficiency. At a most basic level, specialty tea looks and tastes like an agricultural product. Whether the format is loose or in a spacious pyramid tea bag, specialty tea is always whole leaf. Once you've tasted the full potential of the tea leaf in a specialty tea, you'll immediately recognize the difference. Make it your own. The journey into tea is also one of self-discovery. And remember that the expert in anything was once a beginner. Okay. Hello, I'm Maria Uspensky from the Tea Spot. As a participant in the International Virtual Tea Festival, you will get to hear all of the people who are participating in this video in other presentations. So what do we mean when we say tea? In this presentation, we're talking about all products that come from the Camellia sinensis leaf. And it may even sound bogus when people say all tea comes from the same leaf, but it does. It's the same species of leaf. And whether you have a delicate, snowy, downy, white tea leaf, or you have a dark black tea, or a fresh, bright green tea, of which this is an abstract representation, they all came from the same leaf. And the difference is in the cultivar, the terroir, and the processing. And on that note, Bill will explain how that happens. Bill Waddington is known and admired throughout the tea industry for his meticulous sourcing and high quality teas and blends. His Minnesota based company, Tea Source, was awarded Best Specialty Tea Brand at the World Tea Expo in 2019. Let's just talk about the tea plant itself real briefly here. First off, tea comes from Asia, specifically Southeast Asia. Most ethnobotanists think tea comes from Yunnan, originated in Yunnan province of China, although there are a few people who argue for neighboring regions. Um, that's where tea comes from. And all, like Maria said, there are more than 3,000 kinds of teas, easily more than 3,000. They all come from one plant. And that just astounds me after almost a quarter century in this business. Oh, geez. That still astounds me. All those types of tea from one plant. There, all tea can be divided into six basic categories. I'm going to zip through those kind of quickly because other folks will talk about those a little bit too. And then I'll talk about how do they make tea. Six categories of tea, and I kind of go in a graduated scale going downwards when I describe the world of tea. Start off with black tea. Everybody knows black tea. Lipton's, Earl Grey, English Breakfast, my best Jinju Mei from Northern Fujian province. Black tea, everyone kind of knows that. The step down from black tea is dark tea. Not many people know that. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because there's a lot of folks at the festival that um, are talking about dark tea. Pu'er is a subcategory of dark tea. Dark tea has two things that make it unique. Number one, it's a only deliberately aged tea. And during the aging process, microbial activity occurs in the leaf and changes the character of the leaf and the flavor and the aroma. So black tea, dark tea. Oolong tea is down from there. I'm going to skip over oolong for just a second here. The next step down in tea is green tea. Everyone's had green tea. It's lighter, more delicate, softer than a black tea. Oolong tea, I just mentioned before, exists between green and black. It's basically, in fact, some people used to call oolong tea semi-black tea. It's not as strong and, and robust as a black tea, but stronger and typically more full-bodied than a green tea. So you got black, dark, oolong, green, then there's yellow tea. Yellow tea is an outlier. It's wonderful. It's rare. I've never carried more than two yellow teas at once. Look it up. There's actually a great article on Wikipedia about yellow tea, but it's kind of a cool tea if you ever get a chance to try it. And then there's white tea. White tea is basically the unprocessed tea leaf. Almost nothing is done to it. it tends to be light, delicate, soft, textural, almost a buttery quality to it. Wonderful tea. 
that's the world of tea and everything from Camellia sinensis can fit in one of those six categories. Well, how the heck do they make tea? Well, there's four basic steps to making tea. It's worthwhile to understand it's a very benign process and it's a relatively fast process. They don't do that much to the leaf. They mostly shepherd it through a very, very gentle process that can take anywhere from 20 hours to 36 hours and maybe even years. First off, they tip it after the leaf has been plucked. The first step in tea processing is what's called withering. And you can see how this, is tea, this tea is being withered here on withering tables. They basically take the leaf and just lay it out on these long tables where the leaf freshly plucked can interact with the atmosphere. And it can go on for a few hours or a number of hours. Second step is rolling. And that's where they gently manipulate the leaf. In olden days, Chinese tea masters would put the leaf in their hands and roll it around. And they wouldn't try to destroy the leaf, but they would crinkle it. If you've ever seen um, teaware, they call it crackleware, like a little teapot that has like little crackly uh, lines on it. That's what the tea will look like after it's been rolled, typically. They aren't trying to destroy the leaf, but they're trying to break down the cell walls in the leaf so the enzymatic juices can be released. That then, this leads to the third step of tea processing, those enzymatic juices can react with the atmosphere the oxygen in the atmosphere, hence the third step of tea processing, oxidation. And those juices interact with the atmosphere through oxidation. And what is oxidation? Think of an apple. You chop an apple in half, put it on your kitchen counter and come back in 20 minutes. The, the, the insides of the apples where you cut it are kind of dark brown, a little dry. That is oxidation. That's the exact same chemical process that happens with tea leaves, oxidation. And then the last step of Tea processing is what's called firing. They apply a gentle heat to the leaf over a short period of time to pull the last bits of moisture out of the leaf and also to kill any live enzymes in the leaf so it doesn't compost and break and, and go bad on you. So it becomes a stable process. Process, product. Withering, rolling, oxidation, and firing. Those are the four steps of tea. All tea goes through them to some degree or another, and that's the world of tea in a nutshell. And the coolest part is they make new teas all of the time. And some of them are being featured at the festival. Thanks a lot. Next, Babette will talk to us about why tea is more than just a beverage. Babette Donaldson is one of the founding organizers of the International Virtual Tea Festival. She's also head of the International Tea Sippers Society and has written several books on tea, its health benefits, and on how the culture and lifestyle of tea can be enjoyable to people of all ages. The healthiest tea is the one you like the most of the different uh, kinds that Bill just described. Um, but the other one that I like to say is the freshest tea because in all the processing, we change the nature of the original leaf. We, and it, and it, it enhances certain health benefits and perhaps lessens others depending on how we process the tea. So, but the one that is, uh, it, when you get a nice, really fresh green tea that you know was just plucked from the field a few months ago, you're going to taste a huge difference than one that was, that was cut and bagged in a tea bag for your convenience. Still, the one you drink the most is the one that's going to give you the most benefits. But as I veer off a little farther, I believe it's the way we drink tea. I believe it's the, the way we share tea. I believe it's the lifestyle, which is why I'm so, you know, it's, it's what brought, brings us here today. During this time, I think we need uh, to, we're discovering new ways to come together, to share our stories and to share our tea. I think it's lifestyle that we offer people but it's this, this social fabric, it's a social climate. It's reminding us that we are connected to people around the world through this wonderful cup of tea. So every cup of tea we drink, I think we can think back about where it grew, the people that, that worked in the fields to, to plant it, to harvest it, and to do the the very complex manufacturing process that it goes through. And I think that that connection with the whole world is one of the healthiest things that we have about tea. Virginia Untermolen Lovelace is an MD. She was a professor in the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell. 
Her specialty is the science of tasting. She's a published author on this topic and has recently founded Pear Teas, which offers a sense of tea tasting kit. How to pick the teas that you will like yourself. The thing to realize about black tea is um, that there, again, there's a huge variety, but the kind of things that you would want to look for if you're going to choose a black tea and you're thinking in the terms of lifestyle, which I think uh, really informs a huge part of why you're going to choose a tea. Uh, uh, black teas tend to be warm. They tend to be rich. They have some that more that are, are more floral and some that have are more malty. The Assam teas have that malty flavor, but they all share a, a certain um, uh, sweetness. And you'll notice that the sweetness may not come when you're actually sipping the tea, but may hit you afterwards. And one of the joys of tea lies in its uh, aftertastes. And so, uh, in fact, you want to, when you sip a tea, you don't want to gulp it. You want to sip it. And uh, that's why Babette's uh, Tea Sipper Society is so well named, because what you want to do is experience the fullness uh, at the beginning, the middle, and then after you've swallowed the tea, the aftertaste is so glorious. But the thing about green tea is, do, do you like things that are grassy? Do you like things that are vegetal? But then you can kind of divide it uh, a little bit and ask yourself, where did this tea come from? Because in Japan, they steam the tea, which retains more of its grassy and, and so fresh vegetable quality, if you will. Or if it were to be a Chinese green tea, they tend to be pan fired. And when you put that high heat on, what you're gonna get is roasted vegetable flavors in there. To get the benefits of a green tea, but at the same time uh, not have something so bitter is to get a tea that has, for example, puffed rice in it. There are Japanese teas with puffed rice and those are not better and yet you get the green tea uh, benefits that uh, uh, Maria talks about in her, in her work. Luongs are the most, in some ways the most diverse, have the most diverse flavor profiles because, um, but they tend to have a very strong uh, floral quality because of their very intricate and long processing, plus of course their origins and so forth. But if you like the flowers, the smell of flowers, the aromas uh, of flowers, you will want to go and try Wulongs. And Wulongs come in basically three varieties, depending on the degree of, of roast, you might say. And, um, the sort of the middle roast, which is uh, Iron Goddess of Mercy or Tie Guan Yin, is a very good entry place for going into finding about wulongs. It is, it's, it's neither more grassy nor more roasty toasty. It is just right in the middle of a wulong. And then once you've tried a Tie Guan Yin's or Iron Goddess of Mercy, you can then branch out to looking at the other wulongs that are available. Because uh, as I said, if you like something that's floral or if you like something that has stone fruit flavors in it, by stone fruit, I mean apricots and, uh, and peaches and, and uh, nectarines, wulongs are where it's at. Where is more earthy. So if you like earthy flavors, mushroomy flavors, um, some people think of it as, as stale, and there are compounds that correspond to a certain staleness. But you know, some, some people would like that earthy quality. If you like um, a tea is subtle, uh, I'd go for a, a white tea. And uh, a yellow tea is always a surprise. So it's well worth having trying a yellow tea. But I think you should go through the other ones first in order to come to yellow tea. Um, you know, another way of talking about tea is talking about blends. And here, uh, for example, if you take a green tea, a green tea goes well in a, in a mint blend or a lemon blend. You'll see lemon verbena, you'll see lemon myrtle. Green tea also works well with jasmine because jasmine, uh, green tea already has jasmine chemicals, as it were, in it. So the, it, it has that wonderful uh, taste of um, 
chemicals. Um, jasmine also goes very well with wulongs, and you'll find jasmine wulongs as well as being, it, because wulong teas have a lot of jasmine compounds in them already. But one of the most commonly consumed blends is Earl Grey, and people just love Earl Grey. And I think um, that uh, what you get with the Earl Grey is a softening of the harsher qualities of a black tea. Um, in fact, you can go for a, a black tea that isn't, shall we say, one that you could possibly drink by itself. But once you put the bergamot in it, which makes, uh, turns it into a, a, a lovely blend. So I would not, I would, really not shy away from trying the um, non-blended teas. But if you want to just get a sort of gentle entry, you might want to go for some of the blended teas first and then, and then go from there. And uh, yeah, um, but most of all, try it. To close, Julie will talk to us about how to steep loose leaf tea. Julie Tu is a tea educator and social media manager at Tea Lula, a specialty tea retailer in Park Ridge outside of Chicago. Thank you, Maria. It's so wonderful to be part of this group. And um, I'm here to show you how to make that perfect cup of tea. And because here we are during the International Virtual Tea Festival, where we have many different tea consumers, um, I was going to look at this from the perspective of someone who's just beginning their journey of tea. There are so many ways to brew your tea at home or at work, but just brew your tea um, where you enjoy it in the different locations. And there's so many different ways to do this. So, but regardless of the type of tea that you have, and I'm going to do a black tea because that always seems so very accessible to everybody. But just keep in mind that when you are brewing your tea that it it's uh, about temperature as well. So you'll have a, your boiling water. I'm gonna open this up. Now at the store, when we brew tea, we measure out all of our tea so that we have a consistent flavor. But maybe those of you at home, you might have a, um, just a measuring spoon. But for a mug that's about 12 ounces, your typical coffee mug or mug is 12 to 14 ounces. You might want a nice heaping teaspoon. And many of your teas will have brewing instructions on the back. So I will put it in the infuser basket. And once you start brewing your tea, I always tell our customers to brew the tea how you like it. If you want more flavor, add more leaf. I wouldn't brew it for longer because interestingly, the longer you brew your leaf, it's going to get bitter. And that's why a lot of people don't like green teas as well. So I'm sure all of us have had that issue where we might have oversteeped our tea, especially in the beginning when you're starting your journey. So I have here a kettle with boiling water. And I would fill it up to where I need it. And you have a handy dandy timer something like this, or on our phone, everyone has a smartphone, and I set it to three minutes. I like to steep my tea, personally, for about three to four minutes, never longer than five, and that's my black teas. Um, some teas don't take as long as three minutes. A green tea, a beautiful green tea, might only take one minute or two minutes, um, and that is because it's such a gentle leaf. But I find, and maybe if, if this is wrong, but I find that the longer a tea is oxidized, so we're speaking of black teas, dark teas, um, some oolongs that are, are highly oxidized, they can withstand a longer steep time as well. So through the magic <laughs> of video, I do have, and I, will, I won't let this over steep, I promise, but I, I did steep a cup and you would just remove your basket and then you would lay it down on your table or your counter. Don't let it drip everywhere. You know, you just do this. And then you would enjoy your tea. So I've been enjoying my tea in my mug earlier, but um, that is essentially your, your cup of tea. You just need, again, the temperature of the water should be correct. White teas and green teas and oolongs might take lesser temperature, cooler temperature water because leaf is a little more gentle. 
herbals and black teas, dark teas are going to be able to withstand a hotter temperature. But three to five minutes, especially if you're starting out your tea journey, that would be a really nice guideline for you too. So. Maria here from the Tea Spot again. I'd like to just close by adding that you won't have to break the bank to drink great tea. Steeping your own makes even the high end healthiest and tastiest teas a bargain. Yes, loose leaf tea is a screaming deal, and this seems to be a well-protected secret. Everyone thinks it's an unaffordable luxury. You can treat yourself to five premium servings of tea a day for under a dollar. So truly, you can probably afford to steep whatever you love. Your palate and your sense of well-being will thank you for it. So let's raise a cup and toast to your first steps on this journey into tea. <laughs>